Connectra creates opportunities for people living with disabilities by providing information, resources, and programming geared towards greater inclusion and quality of life. Check out some of the programs we offer through our online learning platform, Connect Together, including our Service Mondays, where we highlight a local organization or initiative. Tuesdays are for ABC Studios Art Break with Connectra. Wednesdays are Chair Yoga with Bobby Seal Kobiski. Thursdays are Adaptive Fitness with Ocean Rehab and Fitness. Fridays are Contemporary Improv Dance Classes with Janice Lawrence. And our other initiatives, including presentations from the Disabled Independent Gardeners Association's Growable Program, as well as our Perspective Series. Also coming up is Connectra's next Accessible Community Forum, which is on digital accessibility. Join us on July 21st from 1 to 3 p.m. as we discuss the current digital accessibility climate in BC. Register today at digitalaccessibilityacf.eventbrite.ca. Check out our updated programs calendar on our website, connectra.org, or find us on Facebook at Connectra Society. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Emily and I'm your Connectra Program Coordinator. Um, Maya is also here as the Assistant Program Coordinator of Running Tech and put this wonderful panel together, which is amazing. Um, so first off, I'd just like to take a moment to quickly acknowledge the importance of the land on which this online event is taking place where we are. Um, these are the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, and in particular, the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil First Nations. This acknowledgement is a statement to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their history. So I'm coming to you from Vancouver. Um, we have people sort of all over Canada here. Um, we might even have some people in the States. You can say where you are when you introduce yourself. But thank you for being here. I'm going to introduce our panelists and just give you sort of a rundown of how the conversation is going to work. So welcome to the perspective series on navigating fashion with a disability. Um, if you require closed captioning, make sure you enable those in Zoom. And before we begin, I want to let everyone know that this event is being live streamed to our Facebook and YouTube channels. So whether you want to have your camera on or off, whatever you're comfortable with, but this will live on our socials for eternity <laughs> so we can share it afterwards with our community. We're excited to have an open dialogue here today and answer your questions. Um, attendees, feel free to ask questions in the chat. You also should have the ability to unmute yourself um, so you can ask a question out loud when there's sort of a gap in the conversation. Let's just make sure we're all respectful of each other's different perspectives and make sure everybody has enough time. The hour goes by really quick, so uh, we'll try and be as succinct as we can and cover, cover all of our topics. So I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists, and then um, if they have anything to add, you can add something afterwards, and we'll get into the conversation. I'm going to start with Izzy Camilleri from Is Adaptive. As one of Canada's leading innovative fashion designers, Izzy Camilleri has made a name for herself designing clothing for over 36 years. Izzy has built a reputation by creating pieces that are provocative yet refined, sophisticated, and always wearable. Her designs have been featured in publications from Vogue, InStyle, Harper's Bazaar, and Forbes. She's worked with many celebrities and recently had the honor of designing the iconic metallic leather wardrobe worn by Gord Downey on the historic 2016 Man Machine poem tour. Poem tour. Izzy is based in Toronto, and in 2009, she created Is Adaptive, a revolutionary line of clothing for wheelchair users and people with physical limitations. Izzy, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, you kind of said it all. I was going to say I was from Toronto, but you said that. So thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Next, we'll go to Wendy Wong from June Adaptive. Wendy is the founder of June Adaptive and has close family members who live with disabilities and a background in fashion and tech. June Adaptive helps people who live with disabilities find easy dressing clothing and has been featured in the Globe and Mail, City News, Breakfast Television, fashion magazine, and most importantly, has helped hundreds of families and people who live with disabilities improve their lives. Hi, Wendy, you have anything to add? No, um, other, well, other than that, I'm in Toronto and very happy to be part of this call. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. 
Awesome. Next, we have Katie McMillan and Austin Alanac from Kello Inclusive. So not a fashion company, but Kello Inclusive um, is Canada's first agency to exclusively represent, promote, and advocate for disabled talent. In June 2022, based on their experiences with their disabled daughter who had, uh, uh, had in the modeling world. So in short, Katie and Austin saw an opportunity. They recognized how important it is to have professional and accurate representation of disability, but knew that the support needed to further their mission was lacking in Canada. As such, they decided to do whatever they could to bridge this gap by starting an agency solely focused on supporting and advocating for the entry of disabled Canadians into the industry. Since June 2022, Kello has worked with a growing list of national and international brands and organizations and are continuing to grow rapidly. They're excited to share everything they have learned. Thank you for being here, Katie and Austin. You have anything you want to add? No, you nailed it. Yeah. Thanks for having us. We're based in Edmonton. I don't know if that came up, but, um, you know, lots of things can be done at a distance as per this call. So, yeah. yeah. Good to know. We're all over. We're all over the map here. And last, we have Alexa Jovanovic, <laughs> who uh, founded iDesign while she was a fashion student at Toronto Metropolitan uh, Metropolis University. iDesign is a Canadian clothing brand inclusive to the visually impaired community through featured braille designs on their pieces, which is so cool. Alexa has always loved fashion and her desire to improve inclusivity in the fashion industry inspired her to work with the visually impaired community to create an accessible and trendy brand. iDesign features clothing and accessories with premium materials and bead designs made individually by hand. Alexa's designs have been featured in Vogue, The Globe and Mail, CTV News, and more. Alexa, where are you coming from? So the brand originated in Toronto, but it's been doing really well. So we actually just recently expanded to the U.S. So now we're based in Buffalo as well as Toronto. So today um, is Buffalo. <laughs> okay, amazing. Why Buffalo? Just over across the border, so it's very easy to get back to Toronto, but Buffalo is also very small business friendly. Okay, wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here from all over. Um, I would love to sort of jump into the conversation and talk about how each of you got involved in the adaptive fashion world. So some of your bios touched on it. I'd love us to just go in a little bit more in depth, um, starting with Izzy, if we could. How did you get into this realm? Uh, I... A wheelchair user was referred to me to get some uh, a custom piece made, and I had never worked with someone who lived with a disability, and she was quadriplegic from a, a horrific uh, shooting that happened while she was working in a convenience store when she was 18 in 1982, and um, so I just started working with her, and I and I I had no idea the challenges that she had with clothing and it was just through this this uh relationship that i my eyes were really open to the limitations the challenges and everything she was experiencing around clothes and you know it kind of dawned on me that if she's got all these problems with clothes there's got to be a lot of other people out there with the same problems and so that was you know the seed that was planted and that was around 2005 and so in 2009, I started as adaptive. Incredible. That's amazing. It is really interesting when you are, uh, your eyes are open to a world of struggles that you never really knew existed before. So that's amazing that you decided to do something in that space. And what about you, Wendy? Yeah. So my journey started when I was a teenager. My aunt got into a car accident and became quadriplegic. It was a really difficult time for my whole family. It was, the doctors were using words that we couldn't even understand. Um, and she went from being fully able to needing full-time caregivers to dress her. Um, at the time I was just entering into fashion school and the caregiver said, hey, there's clothes out there that you should get for your aunt that makes it easier um, for her to dress and it's more comfortable for her. And I thought, okay, I can find these items. So I went to the malls and tried to find these items. However, I couldn't find these items anywhere and it was extremely frustrating. 
Um, fast forward over a decade later, my mother-in-law also lives with multiple cirrhosis and she also needs full-time caregivers to dress her. And this is after me being in the industry, for, in the fashion industry for over a decade. And I saw this emerging trend um, and market of adaptive fashion. And I gifted some of these items to my mother-in-law and she loved it. So I thought more people need to know about these items. So I started JuneAdaptive.com so I can um, bring more adaptive clothing items to people who need it and people with disabilities. And that's why I started JuneAdaptive.com. Okay, incredible. So is June Adaptive kind of outsourcing people that are already making these clothes and bringing it together? Or are you making the clothes? No, yeah. So we're a marketplace. So we connect suppliers with consumers. Fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. And Katie and Austin, you said that Kello was in, inspired by your daughter. Can you tell us a little bit about her, her journey and some of the things that you were noticing and the gaps that you wanted to fill? Uh, yeah. Uh, so she's 13 now, uh, and she was born, um, with some brain damage, which resulted in a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. And I remember, you know, truly not knowing what that was going to mean for m our life, um, early on. And, uh, I do remember, I think it was a Facebook post when she was around five, someone posted a, it was a target magazine, um, commercial from, or, uh, a, a picture of a Target magazine from the kids clothing section. It was out of Australia. And there was a little girl in a pediatric walker that was the same pediatric walker that Kelty used. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, you never see mobility aids in fashion like ever. And I just thought it was cool. And I thought, oh, you know, that's something that would be cool for Kelty to do one day. And I sort of filed it away in the back of my mind and then COVID happened and we all had maybe a little more time on our hands to reflect on all those things we'd ever got done when life is too busy. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to send her pictures to a modeling agency. We had had our youngest was four and we had had a family photo shoot and the photographer took some really beautiful pictures of Kelty. So I sent them to an agency in Calgary. Um, I knew nothing about the fashion world, truly. Um, so we were really excited when they signed her and she was with them for just under two years and we were just left feeling like oh my goodness nobody knows what to do with a disabled kid she was the only disabled kid on their roster um the agency was like I have nothing bad to say about them they just didn't know what to do with her like there'd be questions that might come from clients or I would say you know Kelty might be a good you know for example there was like I remember a combi um casting call and they were doing and Kelty sit skis and I remember like trying to communicate that that might be a really cool addition to their you know photo their shoot whatever and it just got so complicated and people were like well I don't know what to do with this so we were just kind of left with a you know frustrated taste in our mouth I guess um but then you know through some connections through this these experiences we met a photographer who had worked overseas with an agency that represents people with disabilities went looking for one in Canada didn't exist um apart from you know a few agencies that had some like inclusive divisions or sort of the unpalatable term of like special projects or whatever but nothing focused on it and austin's quite entrepreneurial and he kind of said you know coming out of covid and all the dissatisfaction that led for a lot of people of being stuck at home he was like let's just start one let's just see and i've been a high school teacher for 15 years and i thought it was maybe a little bit of a crazy idea, but you know, a year later, we're like not regretting it. It's been, there was clearly a gap. Um, so that's kind of the origin story that came out of that. Yeah. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you for sharing all that. And Alexa, can you tell us sort of how you ended up wanting to work with the visually impaired? Of course. So as you sort of mentioned in the bio, I went to school in Toronto for fashion. I uh, always loved fashion growing up, but once I got there, I had several courses about diversity, inclusivity, and disability, and essentially the fact that those elements are pretty much non-existent in our industry. We're making huge improvements now, but when I was in school, that was certainly not the case. So by the time I was in my final year of school, I knew I really wanted to focus on research and disability inclusion. And I didn't know what exactly that would mean, but I was out window shopping, looking for inspiration. And I came across this really cool beaded jacket. And I don't know what it was, but I had this aha moment. And I made the, the connection between the similarity in size between small beads and braille and questioned why this beaded jacket couldn't have a function beyond its aesthetic value. I mean, what if we moved all these beads slightly to actually have legible braille messages that maybe described what the physical garment actually was or provided care content information, anything that could really increase independence and empowerment. So 
did research, nothing remotely close existed. And I started reaching out to local blind individuals in Toronto to talk about their challenges with fashion from how do you choose what to wear in the morning to do clothing trends actually matter to you and all the way to the misconceptions of what it means to look or feel blind. And together, Braille fashion was the result and it had such a positive impact amongst the people that I was working with that they all really encouraged me to transform the research project into a business. So several years later, I was able to do that and I'm really happy that I did. So that's really how it all started was that first university course, but then that window shopping, beaded clothing will forever change my life now. And for so many other people too, that's how it started. That's so incredible. Is there a market more in the States as well for Braille clothing? Is is that happening? Yeah. So when we were, so we've now been in business since 2020 and just looking at a lot of our consumer data, majority of our sales were coming from the United States. So yeah. it kind of just made um, sense to expand and be able to produce out of the US. Um, the number of people living here is just that much larger. Um, but we work in both countries. So really there's no one in the world that uh, can't benefit from adaptive clothing. So just one country at a time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And what is some of the messaging? Yeah, so for example, right now I'm wearing one of our black sweaters with white braille beadwork. Along the crew neckline, it says I Design, which is the name of our brand. But on the sweater, starting at the sleeve, going all the way to the shoulder, it says this sweater was made alongside the blind and visually impaired community. And so all of our pieces are co-designed with community members that goes from everything to choosing what the garment should be, the colors, the placement of the braille and what that braille should actually say. And then beyond that fashion aspect, it's the communications, the marketing, the modeling, and really just being able to make sure that the community is highlighted as much as possible, because really until now, they've been totally overlooked. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's very cool. What everybody right, is doing. <laughs> I would like to talk about some of the challenges with clothing and sort of like what goes into make making a clothing piece adapted adaptive, um, what are some of the key differences that separate able-bodied clothing design from adaptive clothing design? Maybe Izzy, you could start and then uh, we can go to Wendy. Oh, you're on mute. It had to happen at least once. <laughs> it just somebody. There's been a lot of sirens happening here, so I didn't need you guys to hear all that. Um, yeah, so uh, I do specialize in clothes for wheelchair users and people that spend a lot of time in a seated position, but, but not exclusively. Um, some of the things, some of the, the common issues that people have can be dexterity. So being able to do up a button or pull your own pants up or um, like that's one thing. Some people have problems lifting their arms up, let's say to put on a t-shirt or something. So we have tops that open up in the back. So you're able to put them on front to back. And, and that that's usually for someone who does have a caregiver that can do up, do them up at the back. For our clothing that's specific to wheelchair users, we cut the clothes to follow the line of a seated person. So if you're sitting all day, if you can imagine yourself, you know, wearing a pair of jeans, uh, a common issue is that they kind of cut you in your gut. They ride down at the back. And that's because most of the clothes that are designed are designed for a standing frame. And when we sit down, they, they kind of, uh, they're not comfortable because they are actually made for standing. So our clothes are cut from a seated perspective. And when you stand up in our pants, for example, they don't actually look right because they're literally made to follow the line of a seated person. So they, they end up having a, you know more room in the back, more height in the back. The front is actually shorter. Um, and then in our coats and things like that, they're also cut to follow the line of a seated person. You're able to put on our coat while you're seated. You don't have the ability to stand up. They're bottomless. And uh, a lot of the coats have magnet closures, again, for dexterity issues. Or we use zippers with zipper pulls. So if you, you know, you can always stick your finger through the loop to pull it up and down. 
there's a there's a lot of things that can make um, a garment uh, easier for someone to put on if they do have some physical challenges. Amazing. Yes, that's really interesting that most clothes are designed for people when they're standing. So that makes sense. A lot of it is about hanger appeal. So yes. in the store, you know, things just need to look good on the hanger so that they, they you know, will attract you. Um, and so that doesn't take into consideration, for example, let's say a long coat. If you're unable to stand up to put on a coat, mm. like a longer coat, even like a three quarter length coat, you're, if you put it on while you're seated, you're just gonna end up with all this fabric around your waist and behind your back because it can't go any further. So um, often people will just buy like a bomber jacket or something shorter. Yeah. But the problem with that is that, you know, our winters um, are cold and snowy and uh, you end up with snow on your lap, rain, um, and, and it can take a very long time for somebody to warm up after being outside. So covering your lap is really important. And people just end up making all these compromises. And, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, when I realized that there's so much missing out there for, especially like, I, you know, I do specialize in, in clothes for wheelchair users. Um, but yeah, and just even just disability overall. Yeah. So, yeah, making choices that they shouldn't have to make. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Wendy, can you touch on that at all? And maybe speak specifically to people that aren't in wheelchairs as well? Yeah. So um, we carry similar items to Izzy um, at juneadapter.com with uh, magnetic tops and stuff like that. But another item that we carry are uh, shoes with zippers on them. So as Izzy mentioned, some people have dexterity issues and um, they might have a hard time tying up shoelaces. So these are from Friendly Shoes and they actually have a zipper on them. So you can open them and zip them up without um, untying the shoelaces and then zip them close really easily. They were designed by occupational therapists. They're super lightweight and they have a grip, at non-slip grip at the bottom, which is really important for people with uh, stability issues and need a little bit more balance. Um, so that's another really great style that we have. We also use a lot of... Um, magnets um some a lot of our clothes have magnets on about uh, incorporated in it so we have button down shirts with magnets on it or we also have jewelry so bracelets with magnets on it like a lot of people have issues uh putting on their bracelets themselves even if they have disability or not so we have these bracelets with magnets on them um as well as necklaces with magnets on them so it's easy to open and close um Along the lines of open back, we have bottoms that have an open back as well. So you could put on the pants in a seated position and you don't need to stand up to put them on. And this is better if you have a caregiver to help you get dressed and you can put them on while the wear is in a seated position and it just, the back overlap um, covers the back and it buttons up at the back. So those are some additional items that we carry. Amazing, I love the shoes. My dad has Parkinson's disease and is constantly struggling with his footwear, but is like quite fashionable and stubborn. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that's very cool. I'm going to check out Friendly Shoes. Thanks for that. And Alexa, aside from the Braille, is there any other sort of aspects that go into designing clothing for the visually impaired? Absolutely. So with a lot of our pieces, because we work primarily with the blind and visually impaired community, we really try to elevate the uh, textural experience and anything that involves touch. So our t-shirts, for example, all of our customers will say that they are the softest shirts that they own. And because you're dealing with touch, we wanted to really elevate the textile uses. The beads, while they are legible, they also are very smooth to touch. We've had people who have anxiety challenges that say it's actually very calming just to run their fingers over the beads and it's really relaxing. But in addition to that, all of our pieces actually have a QR code in the tagless label on the back of each neck. So someone can actually scan that QR code and it then brings them back to our accessible website and will provide all of the physical descriptions of that garment and the care content. So that's something that's beneficial to someone, whether or not they have a disability. So often the care content label tags are so small, whether or not you are visually impaired, they're challenging to read. And so then it brings you to our accessible website 
you can either read that on your own, use an e-reader, have an audio version. And that's something that any adapt or any fashion brand, adaptive or not, could benefit from adding to their pieces and make them more inclusive to others. We've got a couple other features, like we have a blue dress, for example. It's more formal wear, and we made sure to use a fabric that had a really distinct texture again. But more importantly with this one, it doesn't wrinkle. So if you're visually impaired or blind, you may not know if you have a piece that needs to be steamed or ironed. So this was a really important element for us to test in this particular piece. Then you have things like side slits, making sure that you have really easy walkability. If you might be using a white cane or a dog and have to make a sudden movement, the back of the dress includes a zipper. So we have a very long pull tab so that it's much easier to put on and off. But really, those are just a couple of the things. The QR code is the main one. That's very cool. You talked about earlier how involved the community is sort of in, in your brand. How did that start? Were there focus groups? Were you polling people? How did that sort of come together? Yeah, that's a great question. So it all started with that original research project. I had quite a few one-on-one -on -one interviews where I really was just trying to understand challenges that people had faced over their entire lifetime and made sure that the individuals we were working with had a variety of um, usable sites. So perhaps that person lost their vision when they were quite young, perhaps they didn't lose it till they were in their 40s, or maybe they have just a little bit of residual vision left. So making sure we could have that diverse experience, because um, everybody's lived experience is unique. And it's really important to never assume the needs of someone else. So we've made sure to have a really diverse group of people in those one-on-one -on -one interviews. And then as we've continued to expand, we've had more focus group styles where we can have larger group discussions about those co-design processes. Very cool. Thank you. And Austin and Katie, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, yeah, the modeling. You say talent world. So it, is it also acting and for commercials and whatnot as well, aside from just modeling? It is, I can take that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess quickly, yeah, I guess the other question doesn't really apply to us, but it is obviously very important to us that accessible clothing exists. And we've had the chance to work with, you know, with June Adaptive and, and is uh, not not I yet, but hopefully soon. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe you take this, actually. Well, I was going to say one of the, I mean, to speak to what you're all doing. I mean, it's I, we, our daughter's a wheelchair user and some of the early experiences with that first modeling agency that I mentioned, you know, showing up to a few runway shows and like the clothing choice for Kelty was just like, it was ridiculous. Like this one had this taffeta dress. It was gorgeous dress, but like spilling over the side of the wheelchair, very difficult to get in. Like, you know, and I, I blame no one other than, you know, the world that we're living in is just, you know, no one's been around, you know, chair users in the fashion world enough in like, you know, the runway world to consider these things and the clothing choices and whatnot. So you know, um, part of our side of things is obviously the more people like this representation matters, right? Like it matters. I'm watching it in real time with our daughter. She's 13. And I can tell you like a year and a half ago, she didn't want her wheelchair in her school photo. And now that she's seen so many people and that's all we talk about in our house, you know, is, is folks with disabilities and that's completely changed, um, her confidence levels. But, um, back to, you know, like the fashion side of things, like when you get, when you have a person with a disability on any project or shoot, everybody learns and it becomes really organic. Um, so the fact that a lot of these bigger brands and commercial work, um, you asked about, you know, this kind of broader term of talent. When we started, we thought we'd stay in our lane of modeling, but we the gap is everywhere. I mean, TV, film, commercial um, modeling. So we recognize that when you have you know, a person with a disability on any project in any aspect of this industry, everybody there learns about those things and, and every disability is unique. So, you know, the more you can get out there, the more people are learning, seeing the questions to ask, and even just considering access needs, which are very unique for every person, whether it's access to clothing or access to a physical location um, or access to, you know, reading, writing, script, self-taping process, whatever it may be. Um, so, you know, if you look at it from a bigger broader perspective the entire industry benefits and people start thinking about these questions um on all aspects and all levels of a project everything from wardrobe you know in a project all the way you know 
down to the writing process and how people in TV and film write um, disabled characters, um, et cetera. And it all seems to start with just seeing it and being around it. Yeah. So I knew Katie would have a lot of good things. To, <laughs> I could answer that question. Um, but essentially, yeah, I mean, we started our origin stories is around seeing what hap what's happening in the fashion industry through our daughter. Um, but we're just in, in the position where we don't really want to say no to some of the opportunities that have come up. We, we did start as a modeling agency exclusively, but that didn't last very long. And we got into uh, commercials and TV and film as well. Um, a lot of times there's brands that we work with who sometimes they need a model for, you know, still photography and other times they're doing a, you know, a campaign or a commercial or something like that. And um, so a lot of the connections we've made have kind of led us into the just deep into the entertainment industry generally. Um, and, you know, with a new business, it's kind of tough to say no to things, but so far we're kind of handling it. Okay. I think, um, but there's opportunity everywhere. It's, it's kind of broken everywhere basically. For sure. Yeah. And I think that that's so true. It's just like exposure to the a new situation that makes everyone think about, Oh, we need to think about these and, and adapt some accommodations and, yeah, just sort of learn how to be more inclusive. So I think it's awesome that you also feel like you're educating as you go along. To add in one, like, you know, a stat that was really powerful for me was, you know, 25% roughly of Canadians self-identify as um, disabled, which I think many of us, especially in this room would know. But when you add friends and family members, many of which are sitting also in this room, it's 54% of people uh, that have a close connection to disability. So it truly is shocking. I choose that word intentionally that we're only here now in 2023 thing. It affects a ton of people, um, you know, we're half the population. So, yeah. Absolutely. Can I just ask, do you act as a liaison at all between like advocating for the people that you're working with accommodations, like relaying some of that information, like giving a little education before they come into the actual work environment? Yeah, that's a lot of the work that we do. I mean, the uh, our role is more than that of a traditional talent agency, for sure. There's lots of things that um, come up and and really just the industry is not prepared, generally not prepared and doesn't understand how to work with people with disabilities. So that's kind of what we're here for. Sometimes I'll even be on set like as a as a consultant or whatever, as a, you know, to actually make sure things go smoothly. Um, other times, of course, do it by phone or email. But we've found certainly on on big productions um we've been really impressed you know some of the big brands are really under not that they know how to do it themselves necessarily but they know how to find the right people they know that they need to put the money behind it to make sure that they have all of the accommodations covered um paying extra of course for caregivers to travel with our talent for example things like that um but just we make sure to be really open and uh i guess welcoming to make sure that they know that they can just ask us questions and we just we just we kind of help them to learn so that next time it can be better um and then there's some other projects where it's not so great, but again, that's why we're <laughs> that's why we're needed uh, is to kind of make it better next time, basically. Everyone's always learning, trying to do their best. Yeah, amazing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that might uh, come into trying to promote um, inclusive fashion. Uh, whether or not it's from, you know, Wendy, your perspective of getting the word out and, you know, making this a viable business for you, or Izzy, I don't know if you need to promote or if clients come to you, but what are some of sort of the differences uh, you find? What's the space that you need to occupy when trying to promote sort of your own clothing line? Izzy, you want to start? Well, um, I started back in 2009 when I started Is Adaptive. So there was really nothing other than clothing for the elderly or for people living in long-term care. And the woman I started working with was um, in her late 30s, early 40s. And she wasn't, you know, she was a journalist. So she needed to look professional. She wanted clothes that were going to um, work at her place of work. And in my second client was 23 or 24, and she had broken her back from a, from a sports injury. So I was, so when I started to do my own research, you know, I saw nothing that was catering to a younger demographic. And that, then I decided, well, that's where I'm going to start. And I'm going to start with wardrobe basics because, you know, we all, there's certain things we all pretty well have in our wardrobe, like jeans or a dress pant or a coat or, you know, a shirt, 
you know, a suit for weddings and funerals and, you know, like just the basics. And so promoting that um, was extremely difficult because social media was not like it is today. And um, the population is so diverse with all the different disabilities out there. So when I started to do my research, I was just going down this rabbit hole and I was, I was by myself and I couldn't, I was wearing seven million hats and I couldn't do it all. Um, so it was extremely challenging and, and the only marketing, um, other than reaching out to organizations, um, you know, like, like, it was just it was just too overwhelming to to be able to speak to every kind of disability out there so i would just try to work with organizations that worked with people that lived with a disability and not specific to certain disabilities um but then at the same time i did also work with um bigger organizations that say like the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation who are huge in the States. And although Christopher Reeve was paralyzed, they help the disabled community in general. So, you know, working with existing organizations to be able to access their network was a way of marketing. And then as I, and I also did ads in print uh, in magazines, but again, that was extremely expensive. Um, and then when social media started to uh, open up um, and, and something that was an easier and less expensive way to promote, you know, I did that. I also have um, hooked up with a lot of um, occupational therapists and different um, hospitals and I've done seminars and, um, and people find us through, you know, just Googling adaptive clothing. People find us from there, from, you know, other people, or, you know, if I do a talk show or if I do any kind of television or, or get interviewed, they can learn about us that way. But it's, it's very difficult and, or, you know, like it was a lot more difficult than it is now because, because especially with social media, uh, people with disabilities now have a voice that they never had before and they've had they have a platform that they can use to share their issues or share their you know likes in terms of companies that they've discovered to help the community kind of at large so it's definitely opened up but when I started I was you know walking in the dark and um just really breaking ground and trying to figure it out on my own so, um, so it's definitely been a journey. Yeah, totally. 2009. Yeah. I think teaming up with organizations that already work in the field of people with disabilities is a great, a great call for anybody that's looking to sort of get into this space. Also occupational therapists. We've, we've done that a lot in with our foundation when trying to work, um, on sort of like tech solutions for people that might have mobility limitations and whatnot. So very cool. Wendy, what about you? How do people find out about June Adaptive? And yeah, so we're pretty active on social media. Um, we find that our products are very um, technical, like there's all these features that we need to describe and not a lot, of, a lot of people know about adaptive clothing. So we try to do a lot of product demos in our in our features, in our Instagram features, and we do reels and videos showing how our product works. And that's a really great way to um, advertise. Uh, we've also partnered with the Alzheimer's Society to um, to donate a portion of our sales for Black Friday, Cyber Monday last year. And that was a great way to partner with an organization and get our name out there. Um, and yeah, we also do everything like email marketing um, and, and ads as well. So those are some ways that we advertise our, our brand. I love that. I love that you've teamed up with Alzheimer's. That's very cool. And Alexa, what about you? How does your clientele find out about, about you? Uh, so really, thankfully, a lot of our um, clients have all been through kind of organic conversations. We really haven't done much advertising. Um, but really, I think that it just becomes a huge 
miscommunication in kind of awareness and education. A lot of people, once they hear about the story or what we're doing, they're saying, oh, this is incredible. Why doesn't this already exist? And that's exactly it. So they become that much more inclined to tell somebody else that this exists. But an opportunity um, or a recent kind of publication that I really want to bring up um, that I know at least three of us have been a part of is Fashion Diff. Uh, so there's a really amazing um, TV production company in Canada called AMI TV. It stands for Accessible Media Incorporated. And they just recently released their season two of the show Fashion Diff. So I know both myself and Wendy were able to have our clothes featured on the show. And Izzy is the actual designer on the show. And that I think is an incredible way to start bringing more attention to the importance, not only to the importance of adaptive clothing, but also some of those purchasing options and some of the designers that are working towards making things more inclusive. And my hopes, because right now it's only available streaming in Canada, is that they'll be able to stream in the US and further broaden the number of people that can now access and learn more. Because I think at the very base of it all, it comes down to education and awareness. So there's not necessarily a shortage of designers, especially in Canada, who are creating these amazing adaptive pieces. But if nobody knows about it, or understands why it's important, how are we gonna actually further and change the adaptive clothing agenda? And so I think platforms like Fashion Diss are really incredibly important. And like Izzy was saying, nothing has really existed up until now. So that I think is a huge win for Canada and adaptive clothing as a whole. And hopefully more people will come on board, pick up the network uh, or the show or create an American version, an Australian version, a UK version, because there are so many products out there and just the community doesn't know about them. And that's something that really needs to be changed. What is the, yeah, Izzy, go ahead. I was going to say that you can see it in the United States. You just have to okay. go to AMI.com and the show comes up. I think a lot of people, or yeah, I think it's .com or .ca. Um, but I think it's in the chat now, but you can, you can see it if you're in the United States. So just, okay. just want to say that. Yes. Um, can you elaborate on the premise of the show? Yeah, so um, it was created by um, a woman who has MS. Her name is Audra Shepard. And um, it's a makeover show for people that live with a physical disability. And there are um, three experts. I'm the style expert. There's a hair expert and a makeup expert expert. And the participants that uh, are on the show live with a physical disability. And they're basically given a makeover. And, and, you know, we try to make it as both uh, real, you know, in terms of how they can how they can learn about adaptive clothing, learn about uh, how they can work with their hair, as well as how they can apply makeup if let's say they have a dexterity issues. Um, and maybe if you know, if you don't wear makeup, you know, just even about uh, skincare and, and things like that. And then at the end of the show, we ended off with a, with a fashion shoot and really elevate a person's look and give them an opportunity to be in front of a, a, a fashion photographer. And there's also a, stylist who puts together like together as a group we put together the their final look which sometimes you know through the conversations that we have with the participant um we learn about you know what they're all about maybe what they've always wanted to wear but never thought they could or you know they they've always thought about coloring their hair and they never did and you know things like that that we can make happen so it's a you know it, it's been a lot of fun it's been um a really great opportunity for everybody and, and even the production company itself uh which is called Nikki Ray and Nikki Ray produced the show for AMI um and for them too it was a huge learning experience um with with accommodating people that live with a disability and making sure that we had everything that someone may need. And, um, you know, even as far as a bed, 
if someone can't stay. Um, like we had one participant that had a brain injury and she would often get very tired and would need to lie down. And she was able to walk. Uh, she used a walker, but sometimes she just, you know, she just, her brain just could not function. So she just needed to close her eyes and have a power nap for 10 minutes. So, you know, just, just being as accommodating as possible. So it was a huge learning experience for the production company as well. And um, yeah, and just again, like from what Kello was saying, it's, it's a huge learning experience for everybody. And it, it's all very human as well. And it really makes you more compassionate uh, for your fellow and understanding what, what people go through on a daily basis, just, you know, to get through their life and to be as accommodating as possible to make that as easy as possible. Absolutely. And making those people not feel uncomfortable or any more than they already do about asking for those accommodations mm -hmm. that we, you know, that it's, it's understood. Understood. Yes. Um, that sounds awesome. I'm going to check it out and make sure that we post uh, that on our resource page as well. Cause it sounds one like more thing that yeah. the show won an award at, um, at the, uh, the Keynes festival in, in France. Um, wow. Recently. Fantastic. That's great. Well, then I do hope that it ends up being worldwide, you know, mm -hmm. um, Katie and also I'd love to talk about, uh, the different types of disabilities that you work with, with your clientele. Do you have many people on your roster that have cognitive or invisible disabilities? Is it mainly physical? And maybe if somebody watching this wants to get involved in the modeling or acting world, some steps that they might take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe we'll each touch on that, but yeah. but briefly, yeah, I mean, we represent people with any and every disability. I mean, I guess technically not every disability yet. Our roster, we have 150 people. So, I mean, if we don't have a certain type of disability on the roster, it's not intentional. Um, but no, it's not just physical. Um, uh, really, there's just, there's a there's a gap with everything, as we've said, right? I think, though, it was important to us. I mean, media shapes public perception and seeing. And so it's... There is just as much advocacy work that needs to be done for folks that identify as disability uh, with an invisible disability, no question. Um, neurodiversity um, is, maybe that'll be the next step, but we really focused on visible disability to put it, to, to see it. Like we want, you know, folks to, in just in the general population to have that. And, and truly there's, I mean, very often there's a lot of, um, um, concurrence, right? Someone with a physical disability also might have some neurodiversity or cognitive impairment or whatever that might mean. Um, so it's all, it, it's tied in and we've certainly um, never been exclusionary in, in, in any of those ways because all the support is needed across the board for sure. I, I, I just think, yeah. so certainly that's, again, that was kind of our initial thinking, but then as we've expanded, I mean, in just in, in print modeling, you, it's easier if you can just see it. I mean, of course, to see a wheelchair is very obvious to somebody driving by a billboard or whatever. Um, but as we get into other mediums, there's more opportunity to tell the story. So it's much easier to also, you know, kind of feel like we're making progress in terms of people understanding and, and seeing examples of disability in media, even if it's not like the obvious wheelchair example uh, in every case, right? Yeah, and the narratives of disabled people, the narr the voices are so um, so important to be um, amplified in whatever on whatever platform. And so, yeah, when we speak specifically about still images and print modeling, the visible pieces is, is clearly important. I mean, it is it's a visual industry. Um, but when we get into TV and film, you know, casting authentically, having the people with disabilities included in the storytelling, um, including down to the writing process. We had a really good meeting with the Writers Guild of Canada um, to really speak about, you know, what their experiences have been with um, being able to promote and amplify and produce um, stories that have um, been written by persons with disabilities, casting authentically kind of from the base forward plan, as opposed to that kind of retrospective view, which we're finding right now is um, a really, you know, like a, a project is planned and then sort of closer to the end, there might be somebody on casting or production who's like, you know, we should really include a person with a disability to fall under this umbrella of inclusion or diversity. And then you sort of have to retrofit a little bit. Whereas if we can get those narratives incorporated earlier, um, I think that'll make a lot of headway. 
And then, yeah. So the rest of the question was about around how people can get started or involved, oh, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, again, we all are aware now this deep into the conversation, the issues that exist in the in these industries. And so there haven't really been many enough opportunities for people with disabilities to be on screen or in media. Um, so we don't have a huge expectation for people to come to us with a lot of experience. It's, of course, awesome. There's been some people who are really great, you know, models, actors, influencers, public speakers that we're lucky enough to represent. Um, but a lot of our roster also is people who just have kind of the right the interest and passion and kind of the right attitude. And we work from there. Um, you know, we've also found that there's not a whole lot of inclusive or accessible training opportunities. And so we're kind of working on building some of those so we can just more quickly break down these barriers. Um, so I guess how people get started is just to reach out to us um, is a good start and have those conversations, but also like look for resources that are available to kind of just learn a lot about the industry that you want to be in. Um, Cause it is, it is not easy <laughs> to, to be a successful model or actor or whatever. Yeah. And we have learned like it would do a disservice to the entire disabled community if we show up to this industry with talent that isn't trained. But in the same breath, it's not to no fault of their own. Are they not as trained as their non disabled counterparts or peers? Because up until what, five years ago, it wasn't even something that folks would consider. They're like, oh, you know, I'm visually impaired or I'm a chair user. So I would never become an actor, which is the exact thinking that is ridiculous and that we need to change. So we're sort of trying to figure out what that balance is. Um, because, you know, if you come to a project that is, um, has never worked with persons with disabilities and they get a self tape that is adapted or slightly different, or maybe not as polished as someone who's, you know, been in acting school for however many years or had a bunch of work, you know, that is where the advocacy comes in. But kind of what Austin said, you know, anybody can apply on our website. There's an intake form. You just go in, you fill it out. Um, we'll get back to you when I say we, it'll likely be me, um, who gets back to you and we plan, you know, from there, but it's really the attributes that would be for anybody that are interested, want to learn, um, care about our mission, you know, the, the whole industry is relatively last minute. So I do tell folks like responsiveness is a thing, like, you know, the kind of early bird gets the worm sort of thing. So we want to make sure that we're showing up in all of those like industry standard ways that wouldn't, necessarily change for anybody disability aside um so you know those kinds of qualities but yeah. circling back what austin said there's no expectation of you needing to have experience it's more just an interest of passion care about the mission and you know yeah go on our website and fill in an intake form we'd love to hear from you do people need to have headshots of any sort yes but we also yeah. say go ahead you can just to to same kind of thing it's it's really easy and nice when people have headshots but but you know we've We've uh, we're working with some photographers. Headshots can be expensive, so we've found some photographers at kind of varying um, levels. So you know, sometimes we'll um, find ways to do free or really inexpensive, like rapid headshot sessions, just to get people people started. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, and a lot That's of great. the we've worked with, especially the smaller ones um, who do, who maybe hire a talent, one of our talent who doesn't have headshots, but then they'll share some of their product shots that come from a session, you know, so we can use those on a profile. So we're trying to work around. I mean, again, we want to show up as professional as possible to the industry. So we certainly don't want to have a web page full of, you know, bathroom selfies, but yeah. we also at the same time know that it's, um, it can be a barrier as well, depending on where people are at and budget wise. So trying to find that balance. Yeah, sounds like you're doing a good job at navigating all the gaps. Very cool. Um, as I say, time always flies during these. Uh, we have about five minutes left. I do just really want to touch on um, sort of our thoughts around some larger brands like Tommy Hilfiger and Aerie releasing inclusive fashion lines and sort of how far we've come and how much further we need to go. And if there's any other brands or companies doing great work in the fashion industry that you want to mention really quickly. Izzy, do you want to speak to that first? Sure. Um, well, with brands um, that are doing some really great work, um, there's another shoe company called Billy Footwear, and they um, were started from a, a guy named Billy who has a broken back, and he's a very tall man. And when he was trying to get shoes to work for him after his injury, he just found it impossible. And so he started Billy Footwear. And they have a zipper as well, but the zipper goes around the whole top of the shoe, enabling the shoe to open right up. So you just have to place your foot in the shoe and then zip it up. 
And for people, especially for people that are paralyzed, you know, what I never realize is that when I, or when anybody puts on a pair of shoe, a, a shoe that is able-bodied, we actually crunch our toes to get to the very end. But if you can't do that, um, putting on a shoe could actually be very dangerous because if you're pushing your foot in, your baby toe can flip back and you wouldn't even know it. People have broken nails and only find out at the end of the day when their sock is covered in blood. So these shoes have been a lifesaver and a game changer for so many people. Um, we have a very limited selection on our website, but if you go to billyfootboy.com, they have shoes for children and adults. They also offer like a regular width as well as wide and then wider. So it also accommodates AFOs if you're wearing a, a you know, a foot brace, um, just a really super company and super people. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. Wendy. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> if we're talking about shoes. Yeah. I mean, our daughter, as well as many of our clients wear Billy, Billy shoes. Uh, they're great for sure. Um, I think it's really cool. I mean, there's, you know, examples um, that aren't, um, you know, from companies that are focused on um, adaptive clothing necessarily, but I mean, you know, Nike has had some options for like their fly ease shoes, for example, or at least hands-free shoes, which are interesting. And I am, I've been interested in, in another brand Kizik, um, which is like hands-free. Um, you can put your shoes on without using your hands. But the thing that I think is cool about that is that they've also kind of licensed the technology to other companies. So a lot of other shoe brands now are coming out with these hands-free options for shoes, which isn't the perfect, you know, adaptability or, or adaptive uh, solution, but for a lot of people, it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. There's quite okay. a few brands that are uh, adaptive and inclusive, but they don't really know it like products where the disabled community will share within and be like, Hey, do you have this product? Cause it works really well for whatever. So that's kind of been kind of a side mission of ours is to, you know, tap them on the shoulder and say, Hey, did you know your product is like widely used by the disabled community? And you may not even know, like, our, my best example is Contigo with the non-spill mugs, like every uh, paraplegic that I know oh, wow. that has a water bottle holder on the side has a Contigo because it doesn't spill. And it's pretty like, you know, the, especially the coffee mugs, like, you know, they're all, it's just, and everybody talks about that. So I'm not even sure Contigo knows that they are so what So anyway, that's an amazing angle so to speak for lack of a better word to to approach those companies and say this is huge in the community and you should have some representation for it on your ads very cool wendy do you want to quickly share if you know any sort of um i know jc penny has a line kohl's has a line i think you mentioned target already but it's just great to see all these big brands solely have like growing their adaptive line to make it more mainstream and so more people are aware of these lines existing and that there's these adaptive clothing options for them um when a lot of people don't have a lot of awareness about this adaptive clothing item so i think it's great news that these big brands are uh, participating in the adaptive fashion space starting to yes alexa so many of the incredible brands have already been named, but one kind of piece of food for thought that I'd love to leave everyone with is what if these very mainstream brands started including these adaptive or disability specific items alongside their mainstream offerings? Does there have to be an adaptive sector? Does it have to be, this is our adaptive fashion show and this is our regular mainstream fashion show? How can we blend those? On Tommy Hilfiger's website for collared shirts, could the magnetic option just not be a top toggle down as a feature on that same page? Why does it have to be completely separate? So I think they've done incredible work thus far. I am in no way shaming that, but I'm saying, what if this was the next step forward? And I think these companies that we've listed today can all re can definitely be those leaders in that change. They've got such visibility, but yeah, otherwise any work is great work really in this space. No, that's a great point. I think it's really important to talk about the progress that is being made and the gaps that still exist um, so that everybody can be a part of the conversation and hopefully learn to do and be better. So thank you so much for being here. What an amazing panel. Thank you to Maya for putting this together, um, for all of your participation. Again, we're going to copy this chat and we're going to create a resource page on our website, connector.org. Uh, for anyone that's interested, we have an ACF, that's an accessible community forum coming up 
um, this Friday on navigating, um, it's on digital accessibility. So basically accessible websites, the lack of digital accessibility, again, sort of the progress we've made and the gaps that are still there. So you can register for that for free um, on our Eventbrite. And I, I will put the link in the chat. Perfect. And yes, again, just thank you for the work that you're doing and the space that you're filling. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet you all and hope that we can work together in the future. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Take care. Have a great week, everybody. You too. Bye-bye.